Hello and welcome to the show. I'm your host, Jason Knight, and on each episode of this podcast, I'll be having inspiring conversations with passionate product people. I'll be talking to thought leaders and practitioners to help make you a better product manager, product designer, product marketer, or just build better products. If that sounds like your sort of thing, why not head over to onenightinproduct.com where you can sign up to the mailing list, subscribe on your favorite podcast app, or follow the podcast on your favorite social media platform, and guarantee you never miss another episode again. On tonight's episode, we look at how some of our design decisions can inadvertently lead to domestic and other forms of abuse. This is the point where I give a trigger warning. Whilst we're not going to be talking about specific cases of abuse in excruciating detail tonight, if you or a close friend or a survivor of such abuse, some of the topics we talk about here may feel a little bit uncomfortable. I've put a link to a number of curated resources in the show notes for this episode, so if you do need further support or to find out more, please check them out, and I hope you get the help you need. Tonight, we'll look at some of the ways that abusers can misuse our products to harass, gaslight, stalk, and cause many other types of harm. We'll have a think about whose responsibility this is, and whether this is the sort of thing that companies can sort out themselves, or whether we're going to need regulation to fix it. We also touch on some of the tricky conversations you can have when you're interviewing survivors of domestic abuse, some of the tactics you might employ to make them feel safe and get the insight you need, and why you should absolutely be doing that as part of your product discovery process. For all this and much more, please join us on One Night in Product. So my guest tonight is Eva Penzimug. Eva's a pit bull enthusiast and Harry Potter trivia expert who started her career making spices before moving into the wonderful world of design and noticing a few things weren't quite right. Having seen the impact of decisions made by morally questionable tech businesses designing product features that can harm users and contribute to domestic abuse, she founded the Inclusive Safety Project. She's also written a book on the same topic, Design for Safety, with which she hopes to help us all bake safety into every step of the product design process. Hi Eva, how are you tonight? Hi, I'm good, Jason. How are you? I am fabulous. Thank you very much. It's good to have you here. So first things first, Design for Safety. It's an important book, thought-provoking, takes no prisoners, I think it's fair to say, gets into all the details. And we'll talk about those details in a minute. But first things first, what's the helicopter pitch for the book? The helicopter pitch is that technology is used in a lot of harmful ways in terms of interpersonal harm, especially domestic violence. It's facilitating domestic violence a lot of the time, or it is the domestic violence. And Design for Safety is about sort of how that works and what it looks like and what we as people who work in tech can do about it. And the book's been out for a few months now. I think it came out in August, Mm -hmm. if I remember rightly. So that's enough time for a few people to have picked it up, gone through it, and presumably given you some feedback. So have you had any feedback so far that's kind of really resonated with you, positive feedback that where someone's maybe taken that book and they've had that light bulb moment where they know something that they didn't know before and, and they've come to you and they've pointed that out to you? Yeah. So a lot of people, like the sort of most common thing I hear from people is just like, wow, I had no idea that this was a thing. Yeah. And now I know and feel like I understand it pretty well after reading the book. So that's really great feedback. I've heard some more constructive, but like in a really good way. Mostly there was a little reading group at the place I work, Eighth Light, that was mostly developers reading the book. And they were kind of asking me for help figuring out like what exactly does this look like for developers? Because it is more design centric. So that's been really good to talk to them about like, yeah, how does this work for developers? So I think that'll probably be like a very long blog post at some point. (laughs) And then the final thing is that's been really sort of interesting and that I didn't anticipate is that I've had a few people say, like from reading the book that they've recognized that they were in an abusive relationship or that's something that they were experiencing. Yeah. That, you know, they sort of minimized or thought, you know, didn't, you know, quote unquote, count as abuse that through reading the book, they were able to realize that it is abuse and, and have left abusive partners, which has been really incredible to, to sort of be part of people's journey like that. Yeah, that's really interesting. The whole idea that you don't know that things are happening because you've kind of tuned them out. And I was just thinking about it just as you were speaking there. And I don't know if it's trivializing it slightly, but it's like, it's almost like the abuse version of imposter syndrome. Like, oh, other people have it so much worse than me. It couldn't possibly be anything like you see in the news or whatever, but actually they're getting kind of attacked all the time, one way or another. And it just feels really valuable to have that kind of laid out for them, I guess. 
Absolutely. No, I think that that's a really good way to put it is people, yeah, have imposter syndrome in a way or or minimize their own abuse, especially if there's not a physical element and thinking like, yeah. well, but there's never been there's never been physical harm. So how bad is it really when actually it can still be very severe, even without a physical element? And it's been it's been cool to see people start to sort of recognize that that there are these other elements of abuse, especially technology facilitated. Yeah, it's interesting as well. Like the physical abuse is the most obvious for the most part. Like, I mean, you know, presuming that it's somewhere visible, like you can see it. And it's easy to see that something's wrong that wasn't there before. Whereas the mental abuse is just, it's easy to hide or it's certainly mm-hmm. easy to hide for a while. So I think that idea that the book can kind of, I guess it wasn't really designed to bring those stories out per se. Like it wasn't designed to make people pick up on the fact that they'd been abused it was more designed to stop them being abused but i guess was that like a side effect or did you actually have that in your mind as a kind of a a secondary benefit when you were writing the book you know i was not necessarily thinking about it as a benefit of the book that readers might sort of recognize they were being abused something that i was conscious about though is that i wanted to like very much validate people's abuse so if they had been yeah. through that like all the survivors that i'd interviewed about their experiences I wanted it to feel very validating that, you know, it was abuse, it was severe. So I think, you know, sort of having that mindset most likely translated into this sort of other effect. Yeah. But I remember speaking to someone recently who wrote a book, a different book, who had someone lined up to do a forward for that book. And when they found out that she'd included a section on ethics in tech, they backed out and refused to do the forward anymore. So this isn't something that everyone's comfortable either talking about or even the fact that the conversation exists at all. I mean, have you had any negative feedback yourself from anyone in the community or people that have tried to dismiss the book or troll it in any way, or has it been broadly positive? It's been very broadly positive. I think most people are opting into, like, if you buy the book, I think you're already sort of like on board with the general idea. Since the book has come out, I have been doing some sort of internal trainings for different teams at different companies, which has been really great. But that has been sort of a little bit different in that there are people at those trainings who are there because, you know, their their head of design or whoever it is, is like, hey, we're doing this training with this person who wrote this book. And then I have a little feedback form I send out after those. And it's it's been really interesting, the contrast between people who just pick up the book and say nice things about it and people who, you know, most people who are in these trainings are it's it's overwhelmingly also positive but that's where i've gotten the most pushback and people sort of <laughs> disagreeing with like basically my entire premise of my work and my book that like this isn't actually something we need to care about right so that's been interesting and and like a good reminder that that there are lots of those people out there who are still very resistant to the ideas in the book yeah and that was going to be another question actually the idea that perhaps the people that are most likely to benefit from the book are the least likely to read it because of the things that you've just said. Like, Mm -hmm. were you worried about that up front or is that something that you've kind of looked at since and thought maybe there's more work to do there? Yeah, that's something I've thought a lot about. And I sort of the last chapter in the book is sort of on this topic about like, I don't think we can, like, I think individuals and teams at tech companies have so much power to change things. And like working together, like they, you absolutely can make a big change at a company by pushing for change. But that said, I don't think that's not how we get there. Like that's not how we get to fixing this problem and having like a more ethical tech ecosystem. I think there has to be some type of regulation or laws, rules for to cover those people who are not gonna opt into it willingly and who don't see the value and don't to put it bluntly, don't necessarily care about their users and their well-being. I think there are always going to be people like that. And for those people, there needs to be more, there needs to be something that kind of forces them to opt in. Well, personal choice only works when people make good choices, right? If you put this pe- <laughs> right. put this choice in people's hands, then they can abuse that personal choice as well, which is mm-hmm. one of the negative parts of that. Yeah. But you obviously had already founded the Inclusive Safety Project, which is basically a project that enables you to get out and educate people, do consulting, do research on this stuff. Mm -hmm. What was it that made you specifically think that it was time to write a book and that you were the person to write this book? Because it can't have been an easy book to write. Yeah, it definitely wasn't an easy book to write. So I wanted to write the book 
because I wanted to reach more people. I had been sort of like traveling and doing my conference talk, designing against domestic violence. And that was great, but it was also like just exhausting (laughs) after the first few times I got to travel for work and I was like, oh, this is so great. And then it quickly becomes like, I think you burn out really quickly and just realizing like, I can't do this myself. Yeah, I need a way to scale, so to speak. And a book obviously is a really good way to reach a lot more people, especially when the pandemic happened in conferences, you know, now, now we've sort of figured out remote conferences and there, there's a lot happening now, but especially at the time when I wrote the book proposal, I was like, there aren't even conferences anymore. Like, how can this content get out there? In terms of me being the person to write the book, that is something, I mean, back when I was sort of first doing the conference talk, I had a lot of wrangling about like, am I the person to do this? Obviously, I ended up with yes, as the answer. (laughs) With my experience doing volunteer rape crisis counseling, as well as domestic violence education, and then going into tech, I sort of feel like I had this like unique intersection of experiences that allowed me to do this work and to write this book. And I've been very, very, very conscious about centering survivors and talking to survivors as well as, you know, professionals in the space, advocates who can kind of weigh in on, am I approaching this the right way? Am I doing it right? And so I've relied on that a lot as well. Yeah. And you mentioned early in the book that, of course, you're using some real life examples of abuse that's occurred through the misuse of products. And obviously, real life examples of abuse tend to be told by, as you've said, the people that have been abused, because those are the people that actually have those stories to tell. Now, I know you anonymized many or most of the examples, and that presumably gives some level of comfort to the people that they can kind of talk to you openly about these. But at the same time, those have got to be some really hard conversations and really hard to get those people to even open up in some cases, especially if, you know, in some cases, we all know that people that are survivors of abuse can sometimes feel that they're to blame or that, you know, there's this whole kind of the gaslighting that happens to them throughout the the whole period of abuse. So how did you manage to get these people to open up? And how can we, when we're having these conversations about products and abuse via products, how can we do that? Yeah, so the majority, the vast majority of people that I spoke to were people who saw my conference talk. And I would say sort of at the end, like, if you have a story to share, if you have anything you know, that you think would be useful for me to know, like, come find me. And, you know, it's all anonymous. I'll handle it however you want, basically. So I was really lucky that I think, I think after seeing the talk, there was maybe a certain level of trust. Yeah. In terms of just kind of doing that, though, like when you're in an interview with a user, yeah, it's, it's really hard and it has to be handled really sensitively. And I think all of the sort of elements that we talk about with user interviews, like building rapport, creating a safe environment, helping them understand exactly how this is going to be used. Like all of those things I think are just so much more important when you might be talking about things like domestic violence or other forms of interpersonal harm. So I think it's just about like really, really like nailing those basics, basically. Yeah, absolutely. And like you say, giving them that safe space and I guess making sure that they don't feel that you're judging them or like kind of making them the victim again, I guess, is the problem. Like you definitely don't want to do that. Right. You don't want to like re-traumatize. Exactly. Yeah. Which yeah. some of these it's- conversations presumably could have the possibility of doing, you know, you could be dredging up very unpleasant memories. So sounds like a tricky yeah. balance. Well, yeah. So, and I think, yeah, and that's very true. Something that I've found working with survivors is that they are more than like other groups I've worked with. They're extremely brave and they really want to help other survivors. And once they understand, like, once you say like, Hey, this is, you know, you explain the work or you explain like, this is, I I'm trying to understand this topic so that I can prevent abuse in my product or whatever it is. People like 99% of the time are like, I want to, I want to help you. And they're willing to sort of go through the, the really difficult process of telling you their story. And I think like, yeah, you know, it might be re-traumatizing, but I think like letting the person decide if they're willing to do that yeah. or not, and then respecting that decision. And, you know, they might, people get emotional, obviously, it's like really intense a lot of times, especially depending on what happened. But yeah, if people are wanting to go through that for the sake of your goal to like help other survivors who might be using your product, then I think that's something that we we let them do and we kind of sit with them through that. Absolutely. Now, there are lots of specific examples of how well-meaning tech can be subverted by abusers in the book. What are some of the top things to watch out for as far as you're concerned? Like, 
I'm sure there are many, like you can't just pick one, but like, are there some really obvious, blatantly simple things that people should be looking at in their products today? Like any characteristics or any functionality that's just like top of the list? Look at that and sort that out right now. Yeah. So yeah, there are definitely like a couple big items. One is anything with location data, because I think that can be so, so sneaky and we might not even think about it. But anything that has location data, even if you're like, there's no way that there would be like a second user in this account, or there's no way that someone would go into their girlfriend or boyfriend's phone and look at this app or whatever it is. If there's yeah. any anything to do with location, you just need to be very, very, very careful and think about how necessary is it to show this location? How are we going to make sure that no one else can see it? And this, there's so many different examples of how that shows up that are in the book. And the, the other one that's also very related is is the surveillance issue. Like there was just a article I read maybe a month ago about a writer who had signed into his wife's Google Play for some reason. It was a, you know, a legitimate reason. And then after he signed out, he found that he still had access to some of her information. So oh, wow. things like that, that they're just, yeah, like I said, they're so sneaky and insidious. And we have to be thinking about how would a domestic violence abuser misuse this. Yeah, that's really interesting about the location as well. And like, there just seem to be so many apps that just either default or make it really easy to turn it on and forget about like this whole idea that everything has location. So your pictures are tagged in the right place. I know that you use the example of Strava as well. In the book, you know, I've got Strava, I go running around and every now and then it says that I've been running with a person. Now, that's kind of weird, unless you were like in a race or something. But then even that's kind of weird, right? Ultimately, I can understand if it's with my friends. But if it's just with random people, that's a very weird dynamic. Mm -hmm. But these companies are pushing this tech primarily under the guise of convenience and functionality, right? So they're sitting there and they're saying, it's super convenient to be able to just have all this stuff and it all just works. And I'm as in the gang as the rest of you. know. I've got an Alexa-enabled speaker. My wife and I have joint accounts that we can both access. We both can see each other on location sharing on Android and that works really well for us on many occasions, you know, when you're trying to find each other or obviously when you need to manage finances and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So some people argue that this is the inevitable price of convenience. And if you take away all this functionality, then you just can't develop and you can't have that convenience. Is that something that you buy in any way, shape or form? Or do you think that it's incumbent on them to either take functionality out entirely or find a way to do it more responsibly? Yeah, so I really think that that's sort of like a reduction of the problem or an oversimplification to say like, well, we can have the convenience and then we we have to enable abuse or or we don't get the convenience. Like that's that's such an oversimplification and not at all really what's going on because and you you know like context matters. Like you and your wife can have these location sharing features, they're very convenient and it's fine whereas other couples that wouldn't be the case. So, and I talk about this in the book that there are all these situations, like, for example, the shared bank account. Like, I also have that. I cannot imagine not having a shared bank account with my partner. <laughs> but I think, you know, and this, the thing I talk about in the book, I was able to use, you know, modified screenshots of my own bank account because we had the situation I describe where, like, he was just sort of set as this default user where whenever I have the verification quiz, I see his information. Right. And that was something that I didn't know was going to happen. No one, like the banker, when we were setting this up, nothing in the software ever said that like there's this one person and you're going to see his information. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't have shared bank accounts or we shouldn't have Internet of Things devices or whatever it is that's giving a lot of convenience to people, but we can set them up in such a way that people are going to know that these things are possible and can then plan for it. Or we can do things like like having history logs, or there's all these sort of other things that we can do to, if not prevent the abuse, to at least mitigate it and make people aware that it's happening, help them understand what their options are. There are so many different things we can do. We, we definitely do not have to give up the convenience. And that's not what I'm saying. Yeah. And I think actually, the thing about the logs was something that kind of put a light bulb off in my head as well. It's like, your point in the book was that, for example, people who are being gaslit and not 100% sure if things are happening to them because they can't prove that things are happening or they are sure, but they can't prove them to the police or there's all these other ways that they can be kind of subtly abused and there's no way for them to actually 
understand by looking at these devices that whoever has logged in and done whatever they've done. But it also seems like a really easy thing for these companies to be able to offer. You know, they've, they've got all the information anyway, right? Mm-hmm. Do you think they've just not got around to it yet? Or do you think that they they just don't care? Or I'm just trying to work out why they wouldn't do that. I guess, at least for the Internet of Things devices, obviously, I don't know the answer. My guess is that they're like, why would anyone want to see this? Like, who cares? Right. They don't No user wants this. And maybe it didn't come up in their research, or maybe they weren't asking the right questions. Yeah, I don't think there's anything nefarious with that necessarily. But I do think that they should include it. Absolutely. But that touches on another point I was going to ask about. And that's that I think that what we're saying is that most products aren't explicitly trying to cause harm to people, right? Although obviously some are. You talk about stalkerware, for example, Mm -hmm. which is very specifically trying to stalk people. That's its whole point. Mm -hmm. But aside from that, that the vast majority of these technologies that do allow abuse are kind of enabling it by accident. Like they're because Mm -hmm. someone didn't think about it or they didn't test it in certain scenarios or they, like you say, didn't come up in the research. They didn't maybe interview the right people or a breadth of people that was sufficient to work out all the things that their product could be used for. And you also touched on it earlier about personal responsibility versus legislation. But ultimately, these products are being built by teams, being built by teams of people who work for companies who obviously sponsor the products. Do you place the primary responsibility for finding this stuff out on the teams or the companies or both? So definitely on the companies. And I'm trying to be really intentional and say like company leaders and not sort of have this idea of like a company as a living creature. It's like these they're (laughs) run by like human beings, you know? So yeah, I I put the blame on company leaders. I think (laughs) honestly, they get all the, they like the people who get the profits and whatever other benefits there are from this product existing in the world. I think those are the people who are ultimately responsible for the harm it does as well. And for making sure that their design teams are doing the right thing and actually sort of looking at these issues. I don't think it's very fair to put that responsibility on designers. And I know that's maybe like goes against everything that I'm saying. I think we need to be doing this as individuals and as teams and that we're responsible for trying to do it. But ultimately, the company leaders are the ones who are responsible for like actually making sure that it's happening in a real way. Yeah, so kind of baking it into their processes and making it part of their acceptance criteria for new features or new product lines, I guess. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to those processes and procedures then and things that product teams themselves can potentially start to do within their product discovery and their product development processes, What are some of the, again, low-hanging fruit, like the first items that they should have on their checklist to actually bake this into their process and start to understand upfront whether this is going to be an issue or at least potentially an issue? So I think some of the lowest hanging fruit is if you have any type of customer service team to talk to them about, have you ever had someone call in with any type of issue with abuse or, you know, someone in their account who they don't want to be worried about information being visible and talking to those people and just using that as like your base of research. And that's a really good starting point. And then going through and doing sort of a safety audit, so to speak, of just like the existing products features, especially anything that could enable location, someone seeing another user's location or surveillance, and sort of looking at it from that lens about what you already have can be a lot easier than trying to figure out how this might happen with a new feature as you're building the feature. If the feature already exists, it can be a little bit easier to kind of do that assessment. So I think those are the two sort of low hanging fruits for people who are just starting this. But some people, as we touched on earlier, they don't really like thinking about this stuff. They either don't think it's a problem or they just, they don't have time for it, or they just think it's really unpleasant and depressing and they just don't really want to think about it. Right. And I guess if an entire team of people's like that, then that kind of brings in a problem, right? Because then, again, they're either not going to think it's a problem in the first place or or they're just going to want to avoid it because it sounds nasty. And, you know, you talked earlier about how sad it can be sometimes to talk to some of these people and hear some of these really horrifying stories. And part of what you recommend in the book is that people do that, right? So they go and talk to people from groups that have had abuse like this and try and 
effectively run certain functionality by them or at least try and get some kind of discovery going with people like that that could potentially be victims or mm-hmm. kind of be abused like this. So how can we ease people into it in such a way that they can start to do that without pushing back at the first sign of an unpleasant conversation? Yeah, that's a really good question of how you ease people into this. I think there are there are examples throughout the book of places where designing for safety would also have just made a better user experience in general for yeah. all users. And I think coming at it from that angle can be really useful. Like, for example, in the book, I talk about Tesla. And that's, I think, the only story that I actually use people's real names. My friends, Mark and Claudia, who kind of discovered, you know, he was so excited to finally get a Tesla. And then when they put down their $100 deposit, they did it from her iPad, which was linked to her Apple Pay. And because of that, when they got it, like months later, she was the primary user on the account. And there's like literally no way for him to become a pri- like any type of primary user. He's basically just a driver that she adds. And there's like no way for them to fix that. And there isn't, this isn't an abusive context. It would be very dangerous in an abusive context, but that's not their reality. But it's still, it's just really, really frustrating for them. So coming at it from an approach of, yeah, you know, this matters for safety, but also there's just like a lot of really strong UX case to be made for doing this work could be one method for that. Yeah. No, I think it makes sense that you want to start people at least thinking down that path. And then I guess also hopefully within the companies, you could potentially get the right kind of coaching or or training for these people to be able to have some of those more unpleasant conversations when they are having to speak about things that they're not necessarily comfortable speaking about. So again, it, I guess it just, you don't want them going into one of those really deep conversations about, I don't know, gaslighting that's happened over a period of months and has ended up with people being really traumatized and, you know, breaking down of relationships. That's a really tough first conversation to have, I guess. So just trying to get them to that stage and give them the support to get there probably helps a lot to actually bed this in as a process because otherwise they're just going to not do it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I feel like it's sort of any, it's, it's similar to how I think about, you know, like white people learning about racism or men learning about feminism, like yeah. you have to start somewhere and the bar might be like very low, but that's the reality. And people are all at different points in this journey and, and where they're learning. So trying to like recognize that people aren't going to become experts overnight and that yeah, much as it's not great, some people do need to sort of be like eased into it. And ideally doing that in such a way that doesn't require the labor or re-traumatization of the groups yeah, yeah, involved 100%. is ideal. But yeah, kind of kind of having some empathy for folks that when it comes to designing for safety, it's going to be like a process. Yeah, that's a really good point. Like you don't want someone ill-trained blundering in and making it all worse again, right? So mm-hmm. definitely need some guardrails around that. Yeah, yeah. But one thing I think is fair to say is that there's a body of thought out there that basically says that these companies can police themselves. Yeah, If you think of some of the big companies themselves trying to set up their ridiculous oversight boards like Facebook did or ethics councils or whatever it is that they set up, and of course the most ultra-capitalist and free market libertarians are going to be out there saying that the market's going to fix itself and it's all going to be okay if you just kind of encourage people to do it and they all look after themselves. Now, I know that based on the book and some of the things that you've said in this interview tonight that that's not what you think, but is there any hope in that area that we can do anything with these people, with some of these big tech companies that doesn't require legislation? No. <laughs> <laughs> not to, not to just be really bleak, but I, honestly, I don't think so. I don't think there's any evidence that these big companies can regulate themselves. I think they've shown it over and over again that they're not interested in that. And people who think they can, I'm, I'd be very interested to see sort of like what their evidence is for that. Yeah. And I think, you know, we've seen this before. It's We have plenty of historical examples. Like you look at the auto industry is the one that I'm really into as an yeah. as an example of this not being regulated and doing enormous harm until they got regulated. And there's, you know, every government has a whole department that regulates auto industries and, and highways and whatnot. And, you know, there's tobacco, like there's, there's a bunch of different industries, you know, most industries are regulated and we don't think about it. Like we don't think about the fact that the lamp that's like sitting on your desk 
has all these rules around it so that it doesn't just like explode and catch fire and burn your house down. But like yeah. that happened that had, we had to go through a process for that. And I think that's something that, I mean, I never was thinking about that kind of thing before this. So I, like, I'm not saying I'm not blaming people for not thinking about that, but tech really is just a new sort of product, just like a lamp or a car. It's this new yeah, tech that hasn't been regulated yet that needs to in order to be safe. Yeah, I agree. And I think that people sometimes have a very surprisingly naive view of what the markets and what these companies are going to do, given that their fundamental motivation tends to be dollar signs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But do you see much hope for actual regulatory reform to rein these companies in? Because it hasn't happened yet. Or if it has, it's been around the fringes, right? Like, no one seems to be particularly keen to go up against these companies. And if the US aren't going to do it, then obviously, you know, given the size and the and the power of the US and the and the economy there, like it's probably not going to happen anywhere else, right? Do you think that that's actually going to happen, say, for example, in the US? Yeah, you know, I, I am actually really hopeful about this, especially it's been really helpful for me to sort of look at the history of paradigm shifts. And again, with the auto industry, sort of looking looking at the entire process It was like well over 30 years of work from activists and then sort of the general public understanding that, you know, the auto industry doesn't care about us and, you know, we're getting hurt and we're dying and it's unnecessary because they don't want to make changes that would affect their bottom line and sort of public opinion shifting against them. And then politicians taking notice, like politicians are never ahead of the curve on this stuff with (laughs) with maybe some very few exceptions, like the sort of progressive block here in the U.S. with. AOC and the squad are definitely a, a, my big hope because they're actually trying to sort of get at some of this stuff before public opinion shifts. But the average, you know, politician isn't, they're not ahead of the curve on this stuff. Laws aren't ahead of the curve. They're just the cap on a whole lot of activism and usually public opinion shifting. And the good thing, the thing that really gives me hope is that public opinion is absolutely shifting against big tech. And there is a law right now that's sort of making its way through committees in the U.S. specifically about algorithms and algorithmic justice and transparency, which is really exciting. And it's actually it's actually like a pretty good law that activists are pretty happy with. So we'll see what happens with that. But just the fact that it's been introduced is like a really big deal. And it means that we're hopefully getting to the point and the beginning of the end section, I would say, of the paradigm shift on this front. So you mentioned 30 years for the car industry, for example. Like, Do you think it's going to be 30 years from now or are we already way down that line? I mean, yeah, that law is a start, but like, how far down the path does that get us, do you think? I think we are pretty far down the line, actually. Like, Looking at the history of biased algorithms, it, it started in the 80s is when sort of the first biased algorithm was sort of recognized and dealt with. And then it's taken a long time for public opinion, for people, sort of people outside of tech to really start to understand what that is and what algorithms even are. And even if maybe the average person doesn't, can't exactly explain what an algorithm is, they at least know that there are these things making decisions in the tech and they can be biased. And a lot of times, you know, they're causing a lot of harm. And that is something that the general public is starting to understand. So I think we're, we're pretty far along in that 30 years. Oh, well, hopefully it'll uh, get a move on and get us a bit further along and get to a close soon. I do think it's super interesting about the algorithms though, like you quite often see on sort of social media people saying algorithms can't be biased, AI can't be biased because they just think that the computers are magical and they're just sorting stuff out. And of course that kind of just perpetuates this myth that these companies are looking after us in some way and that they're using all this technology that's not that is basically just neutral and, and helping us out when actually, like you said, and like the book says, there's always potential for this to go wrong in ways that people don't understand and frankly the people that are building the algorithms half the time don't really understand what's going into them right because so much of it's reliant on the data and some of the signals that it detects that they weren't expecting it to detect so yeah i completely agree transparency and openness in ai and algorithmic computing i think is really important Mm -hmm. yeah but what's next for you then and the inclusive safety project so you've got the book And obviously, you've said that you've been doing some talks, some conferences. I know before this started, you said you were doing some other podcasts and stuff as well. So that's a lot. But are there any other initiatives that people should be looking out for or potentially contributing to? Yeah, well, so there's a couple things. 
So yeah, I am doing uh, sort of internal trainings at different companies now, which has been really great. So if you're interested in that, definitely reach out. I'm also working on some sort of like workshops and short courses that individuals or teams can take, you know, if maybe you're not going to get me to be able to like come and actually do a training with your team, but maybe you can use your education budget to do a workshop and sort of like deep dive that way and start to apply some of the learnings into your work. So that'll be coming in 2022. And there was a third thing, maybe more content about Amazon is something that's percolating <sighs> in my brain a lot because there's not like a one-stop shop sort of book about all the different ways that Amazon is evil. So that's been rattling around my brain. <laughs> yeah, I saw on Twitter, you were talking about that a short while ago, like trying to find a definitive book about how crappy Amazon can be in all the different ways that it can be crappy. And Obviously, there's all these classic books like The Everything Store, and they're great, I guess, business biographies to kind of see how things worked on an overall level, but they don't really scratch under the surface because they're kind of fan fiction in a way, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so did you find any books then that actually really dug into the seed the underbelly of Amazon, or are they all kind of positive Jeff Bezos is a hero type books? Yeah, no. So there are a lot of those types of books out there. I was, <laughs> I was surprised. It's kind of gross. But no, so I did find there's lots of, there's some really good books out there, but they're very like specific in the topic they're covering. So there's a couple that are really good that are specifically about like warehouses and what it's like to work in the warehouse, which is yeah. famously, you know, can be really awful. Yeah, not good. Yeah. There's, there's a couple books about the impact on the book industry that Amazon has had, but there's not there. Like I'm, I want a book when I, made that tweet, I was looking for a book that had like all of the things. I'm like, I'm interested in those things, but I'm also interested in like the corporate culture being really toxic and abusive and, yeah. you know, ring the camera system that Amazon owns being very, very problematic and in many different ways. So yeah, so I couldn't find there's there's not that I could find and I looked really hard a book that covers all of the things. So that's your next project right there then. It might be. <laughs> <laughs> And where can people find you then after this? You said to reach out. So like, where's the best place they can come and find you and either continue the conversation or maybe even hire you to come and make them do things a little bit better? Yeah. So the inclusive safety com is going to be the best place to go. Uh, the other ones involve spelling my last name, which is tricky. <laughs> but you, yeah, I'm on Twitter at epenzimoog. But the inclusive safety com is is the best place to go. People can also do my conference talk, Designing Against Domestic Violence. That was something that was happening before the pandemic and has definitely slowed down with the pandemic, just with conferences being what they are and just people being burnt out. You know, it's all very volunteer run. But yeah. if you're if you're interested in becoming a conference speaker, and you're interested in domestic violence and how tech intersects with it, and you want a conference talk like ready to go, then get in touch and I'll help you sort of edit it and you'll you'll work on making it fit for your own culture and context and you can apply to conferences with it so that's something that is still going on that people can can do if they are interested well, that sounds super super interesting well we'll make sure we link all that stuff into the show notes anyway and people can come at you in all the different ways that they need to great well, that's been a fantastic chat and obviously a really important topic. So I'm really glad that you spent the time and obviously thanks for your efforts with you know, writing the book and the Inclusive Safety Project itself. Hopefully we can stay in touch. But yeah, as for now, thanks for taking the time. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jason. This was really fun. As always, thanks for listening. I hope you found the episode inspiring and insightful. If you did, again, I can only encourage you to pop over to OneNightInProduct.com, check out some of my other fantastic guests, sign up to the mailing list or subscribe on your favourite podcast app, and make sure you share it with your friends so you and they can never miss another episode again. I'll be back soon with another inspiring guest, but as for now, thanks and good night. <laughs>